I don't care what it is we're fishing for, understand this. A fish is only active for 10 to 20 percent window out of the day, okay? Now in a 24 hour day, you and I don't know when that is. We'll know if we're fishing because they'll be biting hard, okay? This is, this is the adapting thing that people don't do enough of. That's why you always hear the thing, we went out, they were biting like crazy and they quit, right? You've all heard that, right? You've all done it, right? They bit like crazy and they quit, okay? There was an environmental thing that happened. Maybe, you know, the pressure changed or the wind quit blowing or whatever it is. There's a bazillion things, okay? Something happened. Here's the major thing that happens that nobody seems to correlate in their brain, okay? That 10 to 20% window, when we first get out, we know walleyes are low light feeders. So when we first get out, say, this time of the year, we're ripping blades. Rip, 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 okay? And if about 20 minutes or so goes by and make a couple color changes and move shallow and I'm still seeing fish on the graph but I'm not catching them, we don't waste any time. This is where you guys get caught up in the miracle lure. You went out and that morning you ripped a 10 pounder on the blade bait. You have so much confidence in that, that blade bait now, you're gonna throw it all day every day you go. And it's just, it's not gonna work. Okay, it's not gonna work. When those fish slow down guys, here's what happens. And I use my Thanksgiving dinner thing all the time, dinner time, whatever. Okay, we get up, we go to Thanksgiving dinner, and even dinner at the house or breakfast, I don't care, whatever. What is your normal routine? Three meals and a couple snacks. Six meals and a lot more snacks, whatever, okay? <laughs> but you, you think of things as a meal, correct? Then you think of other things as a snack, on the go type of thing, right? If, if you sit down, guys, and you eat a massive amount of food at Thanksgiving or whatever it is, and it was a big old steak dinner and a mashed potato and whatever, and if your wife, loving uh, woman that she is, walked up to you and she sat that huge plate of food, another one, on your lap, maybe you can eat two helpings, but nine times out of ten, guys, what are you going to do? You're gonna, I'm full, honey, right? You've unbuttoned the pants, your feet kicked back. Your brain is processed to you that you're full. Mine takes a little longer, all right? You are not gonna be able to sit down and eat that great big meal again. I don't care. You're not gonna have the desire in your brain to do it because you're satisfied. That satisfy right there was your 10 to 20% window. Then what happens? You guys continue to rip that blade. That blade bait was the Thanksgiving dinner. It was aggressive. You were fishing it fast, hard, ripping it. Boom, they were slamming it. Great, bang. And then it quits. Now what you have to do, guys, is you got to change gears right here. You got to go, okay, they just fed. We caught some great fish. Time to adjust, boys. We're sliding forward with them. We know they're going to be moving forward to get the light, the heat, the whatever. Then we go to something like, uh, my favorite is a, a Northland Oddball or, or a Fintech Knuckleball Jig Head, 3 8 ounce, depending on the depth. Let's not get into that because there's a million things, okay? With a, a Berkeley Gulp Gobi, okay? A Berkeley Gulp Gobi has got zero action. It's a blunt, a Gobi, guys, uh, understand this. A Gobi is when you hear about Gobies, uh, you're watching a show in the Great Lakes, and a Gobi is an invasive species of a sculpin that's taken over there, and you know, it came in the ballast tank of a ship from another country, whatever, okay? Understand that sculpins, guys, are in every body of water around here. You go to any river, creek, turn a rock, you'll see them. They're, you know, Chad caught one that was like six, seven inches on the, up by Hanford Reach, okay? It was growing big for probably a reason. Biggest one I've ever seen, all right? Anyway, they're, they're in all the systems, all right? And fish will feed on them. With a goby, just like my drop shot technique, not mine personally because I didn't invent it, but what I use it for is to fish that inactive window. Now I've gone from rip, rip, rip and aggressive and slamming fish to now I cast out, it hits the bottom, and understand this about sculpin guys, they don't have swim bladders. They are stuck to the bottom. They go ba da da and stop, ba da da and stop. They're real herky-jerky guys, real high energy, okay? So you throw it out, Hits the bottom, you engage the reel, because you followed it down nice and tight, whatever. Hits the bottom, and then you sit there and you lift. Ah, that was awesome. And then you reel down. And then you lift. And then, I'm not exaggerating speed here, okay? And then you lift, and maybe you go at the end, uh. And then you reel down, and you just sit there. And now before, guys, with the blade bait, 
When they would hit that, it was falling and bam, I mean, you know, boom, you know, reaction strike, Ugh, kill it. Now what happens is you go like this and you're using the right rod and the light line and don't ask me, it's braided line, six pound test, a six pound test fluorocarbon leader on a six to seven, six and a half to seven foot uh, medium action, whatever guys, something with great sensitivity, okay? And you drag and you're dragging along and you go, man, that feels a little heavier. You didn't feel anything, it just feels heavier. And you reel down, and you better set the hook. Okay, don't feel like an idiot if you're setting on air. Because they're gonna pick it up, and they're gonna be swimming with it. And sometimes, if you're not paying attention and you don't do the tight line thing, when you go to reel down, if you don't reel down on a tight line, they've picked it up. And also, when you go to move it, there's no weight there. Well, don't panic, just reel until it starts to go tight and set the hook. You're presenting something in front of them that they want to eat at a pace they want to eat it at. You're tempting them. It's called downsizing, okay? Slowing down. My wife is a downsize professor. That's how I got this. Let me explain downsizing. What do we always have after big Thanksgiving dinner or after a big meal at night? Ice cream? Cake? Cookies? Right? She brings it out to you, she sets it on your lap, here dear, here's some ice cream, oh yeah! And what do you do? You consume it. Present it on your lap, you didn't have to do nothing for it, it's sweet, and mm, that looks good. Okay, you're forcing them to strike. Okay, guys, we've caught fish, walleye, lake trout, pike, having a whole tail out of their mouth, be it a rainbow trout like a walleye, or a white fish on a pike, or a pike minnow on a lake trout. Hanging out. No way nothing's going down there. I can promise. They ain't getting it in there. And a little tiny three inch minnow or a goby hanging out of their mouth. Okay? They're never, they're never going to get to eat it, but their brain tells them to eat it because it's just going real slow. Okay? You've got to change up. Now, if you're throwing that goby throughout the day and all of a sudden the bites start getting the jarring, boom. Like, holy smokes, it crushed it. Get your blade bait out. We're in that next 10% window and start ripping away if you want to. They'll eat a goby all day every day, guys. You're dragging it, a slow presentation. Now I say all day every day, that's an exaggeration. But when you're forcing them into something, that's going to make them eat at that 100% window. That's why the drop shot's successful. It sits in front of them, it shakes around, it tempts them. Okay? Just always be ready to change up. It's never going to be a blade all day long, I'm sorry. Some days it may seem like it. It'll be just ram, 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 great. Peak time was all day, fine. Always be prepared to change up. Now let's talk about color, guys. And this is something that, this is getting into the science of understanding colors, okay? And you hear people all the time, well, it was this color, that color, great, whatever. I don't care. It is what it is. Here's what the science behind it is. Okay. All the color is, all color is, guys, is a, is a ray of light. Some are tighter, some are wider. Some are really, really tight, okay? Now this wide one, this tight one, okay, least powerful to most powerful. Uh, infrared light does not give you skin cancer. Ultraviolet light gives you skin cancer, gives you eye issues. It's a powerful wave that penetrates the skin. Ultraviolet light penetrates deep into the water. We cannot see it. Okay, we don't know what's there. Infrared light, we cannot see. We only feel it. It's not powerful. Not penetrating the skin. Okay? It's just warming the skin. Red, guys, that light ray in optimal clear water is only going to penetrate 30 feet into the water column. As you go in, you go to orange. This goes a little bit further. And guys, this, this science is all depends on water clarity. Okay, this is the basics. Then you go yellow. Then you drop the pin. Okay, you go yellow. And then you go green. Then you go, geez, green, blue, indigo and violet. And then beyond that is ultraviolet. Okay? Who's here has seen a rainbow? If you ever forget this, 
Who's seen a rainbow? What is the colors of a rainbow? When light reflects, reflect, when light goes through glass, what happens? Projects a rainbow. Okay. Next time you look at that rainbow, you're going to go, that Seth's a brilliant fella. He knows how to plagiarize from a lot of people. Okay. This is what you see. As that light, when the rain comes and the light comes out, the atmosphere is saturated. The light's penetrating through there, correct? You're seeing how it's breaking down within that rainbow. Okay? If you ever forget this, look at the rainbow. Red's the one that dissipates first. Okay? Now, if you were to talk to anybody that does any diving, if you and I went down and we were diving, and we dove down and we were wearing orange vests, and we got down to 50 feet and I asked Bob, what color vest am I wearing? Bob's going to say, well, it's orange. Because in his mind, he knows that vest was orange when I went down. But there is no orange at that depth when I tell you to look. Because it's gone. It's in your head that you're seeing it. Okay? It can't be down there. Sorry. You talk to divers that go down like that, deep. Everything they see as they go down is green. What does yellow and green make? Or yellow and blue make? Green. Okay? As they go deeper and deeper, that's the colors that they see. Okay? So, here's what affects that, guys. And here's how I pick a color. If you go out and the water's clear and we're fishing 30 feet and above, you'll see me using a lot of red stuff. We know that walleye see red well, correct? If the water is, say it's, it's cloudy outside, but the water's clear. Well, clouds break down what? Light from the sun. So you're cutting down that ability of that light to penetrate, that color to penetrate. So maybe if it was cloudy early in the morning, we had chartreuse on. As the sun started to come up, the chartreuse started to quit, and you were using a chartreuse jig head. And the chartreuse started to quit. And then I go and switch to a red, or I switch to an orange, and I catch and fish. Well, my buddy and I were using the same goby, the same thing, I don't get it. And Well, he had a red jig head, and I had a green. Well, that's the difference. Because here's what happens, guys. When you go to a wall in the sportsman's warehouse or my tackle store or whatever, and you look at the crankbaits, take for an example, and you look at that and you go, well, there's chrome finish, and then there's the painted finish, and then there's these transparent ones. What's that all about? Guys, it's about this. You can overpower a bait with color. You can overpower it with color. You can overpower a bait with rattles. There's time when a, a, a crankbait early in the morning Okay, here's a, uh, a situation. We go out early in the morning, it's cloudy, and we start throwing a painted bait, okay? A painted surface of chartreuse or green or fire tiger pattern is gonna grab the maximum amount of light available and throw it out. If you look at that bait coming back to you in the early morning, it looks like it's got a glow around it. Have you seen that before on your painted surface baits? It'll look like a, just a glow halo around it. It's throwing that light out. As the sun starts to come up, guys, understand this principle of water. Okay, when the sun is here, it's here, jeez Louise, and it's here, okay? The surface of the water is just like the mirror in your house, okay? I get up in the morning and I go, oh, I don't want to look at myself, okay? The light's doing this, it's doing this, it's doing this, okay? Low light periods, that sun, those rays of light and color are bouncing off the water's surface, so you don't have maximum penetration. What's the stronger wave? Green, right? It's getting in. The red's bouncing, can't penetrate at that angle. As it comes up, maximum penetration, well, now they can see the red better. Here's what I do like this, if you were to break it down. Clear water, guys, there's a million different scenarios here. This is the basics. Okay, at this, what's happening, you're getting some bounce and some penetration. You go out, a green head was working great. Then it slowed down. I put a red head on. The red head started to work great. Then that started to slow down, and I came up here, and I, maybe I put just a chrome head on. Whatever. Or a real neutral color, white. Something off the wall. Okay, something neutral. Crankbait. Painted. Chrome. Transparent. Chrome. Painted. Okay. Chrome here, because it's coming up, the light's coming up, the light's starting to penetrate, the chrome's throwing a nice flash. 
grabbing it in flash. Okay, it's throwing a flash. As it comes up to the top, guys, you can overpower the bait with too much rattle or too much color. Okay, transparent, blade, a transparent bait or a neutral colored bait blends into its environment. It's what they want. Okay, if you have something with too much of a rattle, who here thinks shad profile crankbaits are great for walleyes? Raise your hand. Come on, you guys. Use shad profile. Reef runners, right? Come on, John. I know you're a jig fanatic. Okay. Shad profile stuff. Not a lot of guys will go out and throw a big uh, DT-16 uh, Rapala. Big fat build, okay? The thinner profile, guys, is one, easier for the fish to swallow. Two, puts off less vibration. If you think a fish swims through the water creating as much vibration as that big fat crankbait does, you're crazy. It doesn't, okay? At peak times, 10 to 20%, they're going to take that rattle and love it. Then it's going to have to get more subtle as they become out of that window. Okay? So just understand the colors and how it's penetrating. You guys all understand that? Okay? C green head, orange, red, whatever, neutral, then back down. You're just utilizing the light, guys. It's not about one given color. Now, things that can happen. I had a, one of the fellows, is he still here? I think he is. I don't see him, but he's here. said, when I go into muddy conditions, you know how we all fish the mud lines on Roosevelt? and I'm trolling in there with a spinner, and I've got chartreuse on, and I've, it's been working on the outside or whatever, and I troll into the mud and it doesn't work, and we all know the walleyes like the mud line to use them for ambush, great. Puts on something that's dark, black or purple, okay? Well, I just told you walleye see everything is red or green. Okay, here's the mud. What's the mud doing to that light? Not allowing it to penetrate, it's taking away your color. What color is black, blue? Those go way deep, right? Okay. All that walleye is seeing right now, guys, is a strong silhouette. Understand, if you go out at night and you're fishing or whatever, and you see a bat fly by or you see a bird fly by, you know, like geese moving through, okay? If you see a, a white belly of a geese, you'll hear them, but they're hard to see. If a bat goes zinging by you, you see it, okay? Take something white, stick it on a string, and swing it around at night. Okay? Then take something black and swing it on a string. Black creates a silhouette because indigo and black are down at the bottom. Okay? They're penetrating. It's grabbing the most available light. It's what they're able to see, a silhouette. A bat's black, but we see it. When I go out night fishing for bass at night, I use black baits. It's creating a silhouette. Okay? Now at nighttime, a walleye on a nice moonlit night will eat a fire tiger crankbait. They can see it, okay? But also you can see it with your eyes on the moon at night, okay? If you don't have, night, if you don't have light at night time, guys, use a black and silver. Use something that's dark colored. It'll work for you, okay? That's why that's working. All it's doing is creating a silhouette. That fish is not seeing that chartreuse anymore, okay? They're not seeing it. How about lures that glow? Lures that glow. Lure, glow lures, guys. Yep, glow does this, guys, phosphorescent stuff. Uh, within that color spectrum, once again, it's, it's just a rough for you. Within that color spectrum, you have fluorescence, okay? Fluorescent orange is gonna go further than a standard orange, okay? A glow orange or a straight glow color, glow is what? Green, looks green to you? What that phosphorescing is doing is it's, it's grabbing optimal light. It's creating its own light. It's gonna be seen at a deeper depth, okay? The thing to understand with the phosphorescent stuff, guys, that I've found is that the colder the water, the less the glow is, okay? They lose their charge fast and cold. So you want to constantly be charging, all right? Constantly recharging. Now, I want to touch on something about uh, conservation real quickly, guys, and then we'll get you out of here. I could talk all night. But understand this, and I went to a seminar over, we did a show over in Helena, and one of the top PWT walleye pros was over there, and wins tons of money, and obviously a great fisherman. And along his seminar, somebody asked him, you know, is it okay to kill a, a you know, 10, 12 pounder, 13 pounder? Yeah, he says, if you get a bunch from kill them all. And I about hit the floor. Okay, I about hit the floor. I, I just, I actually just, I had to walk away. Okay? <clears throat> Understand this. And I, 
I've had guys email me on walleyes. I got some videos on YouTube. Oh, that fish isn't that big, and you're lying and whatever. Well, they don't realize that I'm, you know, six foot one and almost 300 pounds either. Okay, so that plays into it a little bit. All right, but he says you want to let the 24 to 20, 20 to 24, 26 inches go. He is a hundred percent right. Okay. Reason is this. He's right on that, and he's wrong on the other side. Reason is this. Those 20 to 24 inch fish in each body of water is a little bit different. Those are your mature fish. Those are the ones that are doing the most reproduction to put back into the system, okay? Uh, if you look at how fish become mature, you know, uh, take a large mouth, a male is three to four years, a female is four to five years, okay? A lot of fish are in that range. It takes them a while to get mature. Those little ratfish, those aren't mature yet. You want to keep some of those, great. They're not putting back into the system. The concept of what he's talking about, guys, is this. Uh, if you're a hardcore hunter, you'll know this. When you go out and you shoot a big bodied elk, and if that elk is past his prime, he's got a messed up rack. He may have big bases, but he's a five over here and a three over here, but my God, he's, he's mad, his body's huge. You clean him out and he just smells like a trash bin. Okay, he's gone past his prime. Okay, we're the same way, right? We go past our prime. Okay, but, but guys, understand this. Our fish here, and what these guys that, that, that are emailing back, I get these emails, and they're from back east, okay? And there's no way a 32-inch fish can weigh that much. Well, guys, these fish are consuming giant rainbows, okay? I go in night walleye fishing because the water temperature goes below 55 degrees at night in the fall time, and the big trout move in. Those walleyes in turn move in. Because now the feed is going to a certain place. It's congregating. It's bringing them together. We catch giant pike on the pond array system, keying in on whitefish spawn. They may be in fast running water on a gravel bar where pike probably shouldn't be at. They're there because the food's there. Okay? When you catch our fish around here, our, they look like in the fall, in this time of year, guys, they look like they're going to explode. If you, pop, if you poke them real hard, they go <laughs> Okay? They're short, compact, squatty fish all the way down through from here on out. They're growing fast, okay? They're still reproducing just fine. So please, if you go out and you follow these things and you stay with them, there's going to be times, guys, like right now it's horrible and the fishing's tough and whatever. You will catch that fish of a lifetime, but just do me a favor. Take a picture of it, get the measurements of it, and put it back. Please put it back, okay? I've been going to the same places catching these fish over. Is it the same fish? I don't know for sure, but every year they seem to get a little bigger. So in my head, I think, you know, they probably are. But don't, you know, I've got a two-year-old at home, and they want to kill the lake trout and all this stuff off, guys. And all I do, and I think about it, is I think of her, or I think about the kids that I see in the, the audience and stuff, them to have a chance to catch that fish. If you're careful with them, guys, put them back in, they're going to go back, they're going to reproduce, it's going to be fine, okay? Because there's no such thing as that fish for a lifetime. I have yet to mount a walleye because I just seem to keep every year get one that's a little bigger, okay? So just waiting, that's all it is. Getting the measurements and just waiting. Turn it back, it feels good. They're not going to eat worth a darn, okay? The smaller ones are always going to eat better, okay? There's a fellow that's keeping big walleyes, guys. What, a 14 and a 12, Chad? 14 and a 12, he kept the 14 to have it mounted. He keeps all the 10s and 12s because the cheek meat's so good. The cheek meat's so good. Okay? Guys, if you go out, Bob and John, you guys have probably done it. You can get out of a 16, 20 inch, or you can take the cheeks out of it if you want it. You know, it's going to be, you know, whatever. It's great eating. But to just, yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's awesome eating, guys. It is. But don't kill the big ones, man. Don't do it. You've got the greatest walleye fishery in the country right here. And if you think I'm kidding to you, go to Walleye Central, go to the 10-pound club, put in Washington and Oregon, and the number of fish that's 10 plus is going to be blown away everything else on there because it's the Columbia River right here. Okay? Let the big fish go. Let them go. Okay? All right, guys, I won't keep you any longer, okay? If you have any questions, just go to the website and email me, okay? Thank you, Seth. You bet, guys.